It's around 8 p.m. in the St. Frederick's Hospital emergency room. The room is white and tall with a cathedral ceiling. Nothing adorns the walls except some type of scanning machine. And besides the entrance, there are only three other locked doors in which one could leave. There is no receptionist and the comfortless seats are made out of stainless steel and are capable of changing colors. The room looks easily washable. One point of interest might be the large inlaid fan in the ceiling. This is due to its large ominous presence and a strange grinding noise it makes every 35 seconds. The room is filled with people of all different types of ailments. One man has a greasy bloody towel wrapped around his hand. He has a baggie in the other hand that contains both a tooth and a thumb. Oddly enough, he doesn't look in pain, but he looks lifeless, like the rest of the people in the room. Not even the child undergoing intense spasms, nor the elderly man who had clearly been shot in the chest looked in pain. Though they are not dead, they have a strange quietness about them. The only way one could tell that they were in pain would be by looking in their vastly dilated eyes. The room wasn't this calm ten minutes ago. All of the crying, moaning, and groaning you might associate with the previous scene were all there. The only difference was the three strangers huddled in the middle. These strangers, dressed in black jumpsuits and wearing full oxygen masks, had each entered from different parts of the room. In the huddle, each of the three members displayed an ID card. One card carried a medical insignia. Another carried an insignia of the United States, and the last person had a card that physically linked the other two. The person who carried the linking card took the two other cards and enabled the linking card. This person then took the joint card and placed it into a small laptop-like device. He then uttered the number 23673 with a gravelly voice towards the machine, and then looked at the others with a look, expecting them to do the same. 74648, he said without emotion, by the woman with the medical insignia on her card. Uh, 62621, said the man who had carried the government insignia on his card. Did I get that right, guys? He continued. The other two just looked at each other with a slight look of disgust. Unlike the somber militarian look to the others, the third was a, a goofy-looking fellow with a large head, and from a first impression, one might consider him to be below average as far as intelligence goes. Before the other two could say anything, he continued once more. Uh, guys, my name is Bill, so according to the sheet, you must be Lanai and Sin. Before he could finish Sinric's name, he interrupted him sternly. You must be new. Quiet now, and just do your job. Lanai nodded and started to follow Sin toward the scanning machine on the wall. As they walked, the people begged and moaned all the more. One sobbing little girl grabbed Sin's leg as he walked. Please help my mommy, said the little girl while she pointed out a woman with a large laceration on her leg. Sin looked down at her, reached his hand down, and unemotionally removed her arm from his leg. He continued walking as the girl stood there crying. As Lanai passed by the girl, she stooped down, put on an obviously fake smile, and said a generic, Everything will be all right. As the two reached the machine on the wall, Sin nodded back to Bill so that he would write down the time in his notebook. Bill obviously didn't understand what he was trying to tell him. Lanai laughed under her breath and looked at Sin. This is my 576 and I can honestly say they get dumber every time, Lanai jokingly said to Sin. This is my 17581 and I don't understand why we don't just mise them from the moment they walk in the door said Sin as he placed the combo card above the scanner. Lanai ignores Sin with a look of disgust on her face as she watches for the scanner to verify the combo card. Bill stands and watches the two and finally realizes that it was his job to write down the time before they verified the combo card. Bleep, bleep, bleep. The machine on the wall beeps and appears to verify the card. The combo card has been verified, Doctor. The computer has assigned chair number one to the upper right corner of quadrant two, said mechanically by Sindrick. We see Lanai walking to the upper right quadrant of the room. 
She has a machine that takes measurements of the various systems of the body and acquires historical and financial data of the patient. One by one she goes through each person, gathering all the data about them. Bill monitors her activities and makes sure she doesn't do anything morally questionable or against the law. Sin stands at the scanner at the wall, holding the combo card in its place the entire time. When Lanai finishes, both her and Bill walk over to the scanner on the wall and we see Lanai give Bill the scanner. He fumbles around trying to interface it with the scanner until Sin helps him maneuver it into position. Sorry guys, says Bill to a glaring Sin. Bleep, bleep, bleep. The machine on the wall beeps again, signaling Sin to remove the combo card. The three huddle together again while Sin dissembles the combo card and gives back the other's cards. After being signaled by Sin, Bill hands over a confirmation key. At this point, the huddle breaks up and Sin signals for Lanai and Bill to leave the room. When the patients in the room see this, everyone grows quiet. Sin looks at his watch and addresses the people in the room. Everyone, please remain in your seats. In about 45 seconds, your chair will turn one of three colors. Red means that you will be going into the door with the red cross on it. If you need assistance, we have stretchers and wheelchairs available. Green means that you need to leave the premises and go elsewhere. Blue means that you must stay seated and you will be treated by government program G4432. Finally, if your chair does not turn a color, you are not a patient and the family waiting room is the one with the American flag on it. Mr. Bill Wyan will be there to answer your questions. A few seconds later, we hear a beep and the chairs start to turn colors. 22 blue, one green, and 17 that remained the same color. Sin is bewildered by the results. Never had he seen so many blue chairs. One or two at most, but never 22. Despite his concern, he stands firm at his post in the middle of the room. We see the people in the natural colored chairs leave first. Most are somber and wave goodbye as they head towards the American flag room. <laughs> the one green chair belonged to a pregnant mother. She begs for Sin to let her in, but he stands firm, emotionless, and sternly tells her to leave. She tells him that she has nowhere else to go, but he does not care. She finally leaves with the help of her husband. As she leaves, Sin notices something unusual. The little girl's chair had turned blue even though she was not a patient. He also notices another child's seat had turned blue too. Usually this does not disturb him, as he mised children in the past, but this seemed very strange. Undaunted, he starts to build a combo card with the confirmation key. Sin finishes the card and walks over to the scanner on the wall. He is now sweating and can hear his own heartbeat speeding up. He tries to collect himself, but then he starts seeing visions of all the people he has mised. The climax of his visions comes when he sees the little girl smiling at him while she is swinging her legs happily in the blue chair. At this point, the remaining people in the room are starting to get nervous too. They wonder what he's doing, as they themselves have never been in a blue chair and only think that their wait for service will be longer. One elderly man with a gunshot wound finally puts the clues together. With all his might, he yells for Sin to stop. Others in the room finally understand what is happening too. They look in horror as Sin puts the combo card near the scanner. One man tries to get up to stop him, and he slowly walks over and begs for Sin to stop. But Sin is getting more confused, more scared, and finally does what his years of instinct and training have taught him to do. He puts the card up to the machine. A dense smoke fills the room and then leaves as quick as it came. Everyone is strangely silent with dilated pupils. Even the man with a greasy towel wrapped around his severed thumb has nothing to say. The little girl that was previously worried about her mommy worried no more. The old man with the gunshot wound lacked the fear that he had had just moments before. And in a few minutes, these bodies would live no more. Sin watched as this took place before him and he too fell to the floor, but it wasn't due to the substance in the air as he was still breathing the fresh oxygen that filled his mask. He had finally realized 
that he was nothing but a murderer who worked for the government. He had just murdered 22 people and he had murdered probably a thousand more in the past. It was easier for him before because those who were mized were mostly transients, people without families and criminals. These people seem to have none of those traits, especially that little girl. Sin wanted answers and his anger was building by the moment. After a few more seconds of watching his patience fall into eternal rest, he sprung up and headed out his door. The door lacked a label or any type of marking. It was solid white. He blasted out the door and into a familiar long hallway. At the end of this silver, brightly lit hallway was an elevator. Sin ran inside and waited for the computer to speak. Which floor? The computer said without emotion. With a look of determination, Sin said, Level 15! Was the noise the elevator made as it slowly ascended. As the door opened at level 15, Sin was greeted by a large open office with one man sitting in the back of the room. There are several monitors on the desk that obscure the man's face. Sin, furious, walks to the desk at a faster than usual pace. We have a problem. The system has a problem. Sin firmly said as he walked. At this point, Sin can see the man behind the desk. Though it is not really obvious due to the man's dark and grizzled features, he looks puzzled. Sinric, right? He says in a calm voice. Please sit down. Frustrated, Sin sits down. As he does, the monitors mechanically move out of the man behind the desk's field of vision. He looks at Sin and smirks. Sin continues. The program just eliminated. Sin is interrupted by the man behind the desk. Yes, we seem to be having a few problems with the program. In fact, I was just watching your performance and I had a few questions for you. Your efficiency was below normal and for a man with over 17K, this might be a sign of a problem. No, I just mized 22 people. Something is wrong with the program, Sin said with growing anger. At this point, full arm restraints come out of the chair that Sin is sitting in and lock him into place. No, the problem isn't with G4432. It has had a few adjustments due to the state of the economy. The problem I was referring to is you. What? Sin has a look of shock on his face as he struggles to get out of the restraints. The man behind the desk lightly laughs at Sin. You, just like the people downstairs, have a problem, the man said snidely. Your overall expected lifetime output is less than the state's input. Thus, you're being cut from the budget. The man behind the desk said a few more words, but Sin did not hear them as he was slowly fading away from consciousness. Since he had never taken off his suit, it appears that something had filled the air inside of it. All Sin saw was a faint bit of smoke as everything faded to white. <laughs>